We're going to study his word together as we transition to a new series called Imago Day. And before we read our text, because I don't normally title sermons that uh, the title of which is not in English. So we're going to kind of unpack a little bit of what Imago Day means. If you took Spanish, you can kind of intuitively figure it out, or if you're studying Latin. But before we read our text, let's just talk about the big idea. If you've got notes there with you, um, we're going to begin here. So the doctrine of Imago Day is established in Genesis in these words, and God created man in his own image, there's Imago Dei, in his, the image of God, male and female, he created them. So humans were created in the image of God, which meant two primary things in Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two, it becomes really clear. It means dignity and it means responsibility. So humans bear worth and dignity simply by, not by virtue of what they will accomplish or what they will achieve in life. They bear dignity and worth simply by virtue of the fact that they were made in the image of God. Every person made, every human being born in this world from the womb to the tomb bears worth and dignity because we bear God's image. So there's dignity and then there's responsibility. So I'm going to put on the screen something from Genesis chapter 1. Right after God says, I'm going to make them in my own image, he makes them. And then verse 28 says, God blessed them and God said to them, and here's responsibility, be fruitful. He gives them a task list. Multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. So they had this responsibility given by God to rule the earth in his behalf. They were vice regents, empowered, delegated with stewardship over creation itself. Subdue the world, fill the world, cause the world to flourish, care for this world that I have given you. So image bear. What it means to be imago Dei, to be uh, made in the image of God, means you have, I have, all human beings have dignity and worth in the eyes of God and should be recognized by us and responsibility in the world. Now, if you've read after Genesis 1 and 2, you find out things go sideways in a major way in Genesis chapter 3, right? Because Adam and Eve, they sinned against God, they transgressed God's law, and then sin comes pouring into the world. All the relationships are broken. Man's relationship with God is broken. Man's relationship with man is broken, right? There's all marital strife and fratricide where the, the first baby born kills the second baby born, right? So there's all kinds of chaos in human relationships. But here's the thing, and it's in your notes. As we track the backstory here, even after the fall, though the image of God was distorted in humans, it was not destroyed. So God's image, this something of the stamp of God's dignity remains in every fallen human being. It remains the same. There's still responsibility and there's still the stamp of God's own image. His fingerprints are still on human hearts and human lives. But here's the thing that we know if we keep reading the Bible is that God's plan was to fully restore his image. And in order to do that, he had to send his son, Jesus Christ, his perfect image, his own son. The radiance of the glory of God showed up on earth and through his cross, God reconciles humans back to him and tears down the dividing wall between humans and one another. He's reconciling us to each other and reconciling us back to God through Christ. And what, does, what is God doing in this new family that he is bringing together in Jesus Christ and through the blood of Christ and his death on the cross is he is he moves in by his spirit, doesn't he? And he conforms us to what? To the image of Jesus Christ. So we are, the, the fullness of God's image is being restored through the gospel, through the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of Christ's people so that we reflect his character. So now we come full circle and now we honor what God honors. We love what God loves. We're reflecting his image. We're looking more and more like him. So really this series, Imago Dei, it's, it's gonna ask a number of questions and, but essentially the question we're asking in this series is why do Christians care? Why, why do Christians care about protecting the unborn? Why do Christians care about racial reconciliation? 
Why did Jesus tell his church to run to all the wrong people? Why did Jesus tell his church to run to the poor, the lame, the outcast, the orphan, the widow, the stranger, the leper? Why did Jesus say, go, go get them? Because God wanted to show the world he's a God of life and life matters to him. Even the lives that seem to be discarded by the world, they matter greatly to God. That's what this series is about, which is why our text in Exodus chapter 1, I hope you've got it open. I don't. Hold on. Let me get there. Um, In Exodus chapter 1 begins with these words. These, you see those first four words? These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt. It begins with the words, these are the names. So in English, we name this book by what happens in this book. We name it Exodus. In the original Hebrew, this book's name is the first four words of this text. The name of this, and it's two words in Hebrew, el Samat, and it's translated the first four words of your text. These are the names, that's the name of the book. These are the names. The, the upshot is, uh, we're, we're four verses into the book of Exodus before we remember and are reminded names matter to God. Lives matter to God. Oppression is not okay. The genocide of the unborn, which have, all of that begins to unfold dramatically in chapter one, and God is saying, I just want to register from the outset, that's not okay. These are my creatures made in my image. Names matter, life matters. So so verse one to five, what's happening here? We're gonna read our text in just a moment, uh, starting a little further in. Verse one to five, you just glance down and you see the names of the sons of Jacob. Jacob is also renamed Israel. So these are the sons of Israel, right? And, um, And so we find out how many of the sons of Jacob came over into Egypt years ago. And we find out right there, it's, it's 70 is the number. 70 is the number of people centuries earlier who moved, migrated to Egypt to find protection from famine because God had already installed through a series of amazing providences we don't have time to go into. He had installed Joseph, a son of Jacob, in a high-ranking office right next to Pharaoh's office, right next to the king of Egypt. Joseph sat and Joseph offered to his family, he said, come here and be saved from starvation, be saved from famine. I got food coming out of my ears in Egypt and you'll never miss a meal. You come here, we'll take care of you. I've found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh. And so that's backstory though because Joseph is dead by the time we get to the book of Exodus. Joseph, not only Joseph, you find out in the first, in verse six, that whole generation that was alive when Joseph was alive, they died years ago. In fact, they died centuries ago. So centuries have passed, and we find out the current situation in Egypt. Now we're 15th century BC, and here's the situation on the ground in Egypt. Look with me at verse six as we read God's word. Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation eventually died. But the Israelites, here's what's happening now, were fruitful, increased rapidly, multiplied and became extremely numerous so that over the course of time and centuries, the land was filled with them. A new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. And he said to his people, look, The Israelite people are more numerous and powerful than we are. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them. Otherwise, they will multiply further. And when war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So this is a preemptive strike against a future overthrow, right? Verse 11, so the Egyptians assigned taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. They built Pithom and Ramesses as supply cities for Pharaoh. But the more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. You just can't keep these people down. God is like injecting fertility drugs into the water in Goshen and they just keep multiplying, right? Verse 13, they worked the Israelites ruthlessly and made their lives bitter with difficult labor and brick and mortar and in all kinds of field work. They ruthlessly imposed this work on them. Verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, so here's, here's the next plan. The first whose name was Shipra and the second whose name was Pua. 
When you help Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this and let the boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, they're snarky. The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous (laughs) and give birth before the midwife can get to them. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very numerous since the midwives feared God. He gave them families. Pharaoh then commanded all his people, you must, here's the final plan, the final solution, you must throw every son born to the Hebrews into the Nile, but let every daughter live. So we've talked about backstory. Now let's talk about this story. What we see in verse 7 is, this is in your notes, Exodus begins with a family in Egypt and it is at this point a rapidly growing family. We've passed time. The pictures of Joseph and the old Pharaoh that were on the walls of the palace, those pictures came down centuries ago. They're in some dusty bin somewhere, and this particular Pharaoh isn't studying the history of the amicable relationship that Israel has enjoyed with Pharaohs of the past. He just says, I have a practical situation on my hands. The people who are the minority are about to become the majority, and if they get any fancy ideas, they can overthrow us because they're multiplying way faster than we are. So you see that in verse seven, there's even a a, a language that harkens all the way back to the original creation mandate. They are being fruitful and multiplying and filling the land. They're filling the earth, right? And so Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he, he reasons if we don't do something within a generation or two, they can easily gain power. So he puts them to forced labor and he makes them slaves of Egypt and now they have to do all this work, right? But but the plan doesn't work. You see again in verse 12, just to remind us, the more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and that's when the new plan comes out. Look again with me at verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, the first whose name was Shipra and the second whose name was Pua. So it's really easy to miss this, but notice throughout this passage, um, the, the most important man in the world at this time is Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt doesn't get a name. He's, he's king what's his name through this whole Past. Matter of fact, the only people in this passage after the children of Israel are named in the first couple of verses, the only people who are named are the midwives. <laughs> it seems to be even a lesson tucked into this about the character of our God. God doesn't exalt the arrogant. He exalts the lowly. He exalts the lowly. M- Moses dignifies exactly the wrong people in Exodus chapter one. Matter of fact, it's not just Exodus chapter one. So in the early goings of Exodus at large, apart from the naming of the children of Israel, no one is named but these two midwives. The king of the world in this text, again, he's he's king, what's his name? The magicians who have dark and dazzling powers are called the magicians. The elders of Israel are called the elders. But here, Moses stops and says, I want to tell you two names and I don't want you ever to forget these two names. Their names are Shipra and Pua. You've never heard of them, but you need to. Because if it weren't for them, I'm not writing this book. If it weren't for them, I'm not alive. He says, they saved lives. They disobeyed the order of the king of the world. He gave them a command. He wasn't calling them in for a brainstorming session. He gave them a directive from on high, and they walked out and tore it up. You've got to know who these women are. They're amazingly brave women, and history should know who they were because they saved image bearers. The scariest ruler on earth summoned them to the court, gave them an order, and they immediately ignored it. And you see what the order is. Verse 16. When you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. And if the child is a son, kill him, but if it's a daughter, she may live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. 
they let the boys live. So think about the plan for just a second. Just kill the boys. So what's he doing? He's, um, he's doing two things at the same time. He's controlling the population and he's preempting the development of an army. He is, he is killing Israel's warriors before they can fight for themselves. He's taking out the future army. But here's the thing, is he wants it to be a covert operation. He could send his troops down every street in Goshen and get the job done and just find out, okay, what's the gender? Take the diaper off. Okay, he comes with us, and they haul him off. And he could do that very easily. Matter of fact, he's going to resort to that later on at the end of this chapter. But for now, plan A is he wants this to be a covert operation. He wants these midwives to actually just do a little thing right then when they're catching, if it's a boy, do a thing they won't know, call it a stillborn. And you imagine, would these Hebrew midwives have done this for a song? Would they have done it just because they, they loved their Pharaoh who oppressed their people <laughs> and their husbands? No, he, he probably brought out all the weaponry. He probably brought out the carrot and the stick. He probably said the empire will be very thankful to you. And he probably also, if he didn't say it, they certainly knew it. You don't, you don't take this guy's word as a suggestion. You do it or you die. They would have known that. But what did they do in our notes? The midwives chose to obey God and preserve life. You see, verse 17 the midwives, however, so here's the basis of what motivated them to do what they did, feared God and did not do as King What's-His-Name had told them to do, right? They let the boys live. And it's not hard to use our imagination to figure out how these shrewd, smart, crafty women pulled it off. We're, we're going all neutrals. All the Hebrew seamstresses, there's no more blue that's for sale anywhere. No, no boys are going to be wearing, we're not going to be selling any onesies that say Bass Pro Shop, right? Nobody's wearing camos, right? There's nothing that gives away the gender of the child. All the gender reveal parties, both balloons are filled with pink confetti. Like there's th th just boys, we're, we're quieting down, we're turning the lights away from the boys. But you know, actually... Um, in the ancient Near East, particularly in impoverished communities, the, the boys and girls dressed alike. They, they didn't have designer clothes for, for boys and designer clothes that looked like they fit girls better. It was just the same set of clothes, right? They, and they wore long hair. So it's going to take you some time to be able to clearly differentiate. So think about the clothes worn by the slave community in Auschwitz. Here's a picture. So where are the boys and where are the girls? And these are older, right? Can you be sure? So you can see this is probably the same kind of way that they pulled it off. But here's the thing. Eventually the boys mature, and years later it would have been easy for the Egyptian troops to spot groups of Hebrew boys and Hebrew girls and see those are boys and those are girls, and those are the same number. The ratios aren't what they should be. So verse 18 comes years later. Thousands of boys have been spared. And finally, the king of Egypt finds out the ruse is up. Verse 18, so the king of Egypt summoned the midwives. That's a scary meeting. Can you imagine? And he asked them, why have you done this? You sneaky women. Why, why have you let these boys live? I was clear as day, and you let these boys live. <laughs> and these midwives, there's almost humor in the text. These midwives are so awesome, and they've got crazy poker faces. They, they basically say, look, Israelite women aren't like your women. Right? We don't have the luxury of, of having a baby all day long. We got your clothes to iron, so we got to get back to work. Right? We're, it's almost a jab. <laughs> We're not like you. We don't have the same luxuries you have. So here's what happens, Pharaoh. These Israelite women, they call us the midwife union. These two women would have represented a large number of, of midwives in the Hebrew community. They call us, but by the time we get there, they're holding the boy. 
and you wanted this to be a covert operation, right? So it's too late. By the time we get there, if they've had the baby, it's too late. Sorry. I mean, now, of course, probably the backstory is these Hebrew midwives are taking every wrong, to, oh, I missed the exit, right? They're every wrong turn they can before they get there. They're driving under the speed limit, right? Every reason they possibly can to not get there until the baby is born. <laughs> It's beautiful. God says it's beautiful because he blesses these women in response to what they did before Pharaoh. It says, so God was good to them for this little trick that they hatched. <laughs> you might ask the question, so wait, what's the ethical implications of this? Didn't, weren't they deceptive? He told them to do something and they didn't do it. And they, even the reporting of things seems a little bit off, right? Think about it this way. So it's, it's November 1938, and you're hiding a Jewish family in your house, and you hear a knock on the front door, and the Nazi soldiers say, are there any Jews in here? How many Jews are in your house? You don't owe them the number four, do you? And that's kind of the situation here. Pharaoh is overstepping his bounds. The Hebrew wives don't owe him the information he seeks. The Magi didn't owe Herod the information he sought. They knew his plans were murderous. And God calls what these women did the fear of the Lord. They knew something. They knew this. It's not ours to take life created in God's image. It's not ours to take life created in God's image. It's ours wherever we can to preserve life created in God, to contend for life. Even at the risk of our own lives, Imago Day is stamped onto these thousands of Hebrew baby boys, and life matters to God, and we are made in His image, so we reflect His image when we protect life. That was stamped on their souls. Here's another truth think about it. If the midwives didn't do what they did, we wouldn't be where we are. Not only would Moses not be writing what he's writing, we wouldn't be where we are. What, think about it. Because a generation of, he, a whole generation of Hebrew boys would have been wiped out, which means a noteworthy son of Abraham, namely a guy named Judah. Judah's line would be decimated because all of his downstream was taken out of the picture. And if that line ends in 1400s BC, there's no David. And if there's no David, there's no city of David. There's no Bethlehem. There, if there's no David, there's no son of David. There's no Messiah that arrived. If these women obeyed the decree of the king of the world, to borrow from C.S. Lewis, it's always winter and never Christmas. The Christ child never arrives, which means we're still dead in our sins if they obeyed him. <laughs> Praise God. They were sneaky. <laughs> Praise God, they came up with a crafty plan to save lives. There was this line of providences that led to Jesus hanging on a cross to forgive the sins of all who trust in him. And that line of providences runs through the court of Pharaoh as two women left saying, there's no way we're doing that. Not a chance, there's no way. We're doing that. And this, this is when Pharaoh's true colors come shining through because he said, fine, okay, I'll buy it, plan B. And then he shows up on Egyptian TV and he says, all of you Egypt, listen to my words. You see a Hebrew boy, a Hebrew child in the streets, bring him to me and we're tossing him in the Nile River. Plan B. It's no more covert operation. We have to stop these people. We have to end these lives. And it's the first Holocaust. And now the wailing begins, and you can hear all over Goshen, women wailing up and down every street as the Hebrew boys are gathered up by force and tossed into the Nile River. It's an intentional play on words in this same book. Later on, when Moses, so years later, Moses and the children of Israel and they pass through the Red Sea, 
And what happens when they get to dry ground on the other side and the Egyptian soldiers come running in after them? And God does what? He closes the water on the Egyptian army. And the song that the Israelites sing on the other side of the water is, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. It's the exact same Hebrew construction as was used when Pharaoh said, throw the Hebrew boys into the river. And God says, you threw baby vulnerable Hebrew boys into the Nile and then I threw your entire army into the sea. Don't mess with life. It's God's word. Names matter. The name of the book is These Are the Names. Where are we now? So we wish that this evil was confined to the ancient world. There's um, there's something online that you can look up, it's called worldometer.com, and you can look up real-time numbers as they're changing from day to day and moment to moment, it's a real-time number. If you look up the number of abortions worldwide this year, as of last night, worldwide abortions just this year, 26.5 million babies, image bearers, powerless, can't speak, can't defend themselves, can't fight, dying all over the world. And it's not just around the world, it's right here in our own soil. Satan's program of the systematic destruction of the most vulnerable image bearers is a booming enterprise in the United States of America. You know the numbers here, they're horrific as well. Since Roe v. Wade decision was handed down in 1973, 62 million babies killed in the womb. Most of those abortions are girls in this case. Most of them statistically are girls. You know, calling the abortion clinic women's health care is a cruel irony because if a woman walks into that health care clinic to abort her daughter. Two women walk into the clinic. One walks out with a care package and the other leaves in a body bag. How, how, how can we call that women's health care? It's a cruel irony. You might say, if you're trying to keep a pulse on where things are going right now in our country, you might say, Is, isn't our culture though, isn't America tilting in a better direction, tilting toward Life, a leading feminist and pro-abortion advocate says this, and I quote, most Americans are pro-life with three exceptions, rape, incest, and my situation. Abortion advocates lose no sleep over pro-life ideology as long as it's pro-life ideology without any action. As, um, as kids, our, our family growing up, we participated in March for Life rallies. I don't know if any of you have did this, um, but we would walk through the French Quarter and m- for miles, believers r- running down the streets for miles, you would just hear believers singing hymns, walking, praying. We would kneel down at the end of the walk and pray that God would turn hearts I remember that. And we were taught from the Bible, we were taught that life begins at conception, that God forms a baby in the womb with his own fingers, with his own hands, and that God doesn't wait for the birthday to speak purpose into the life of the child who has been conceived in the womb. He speaks purpose at conception. Jeremiah the prophet, before I formed you in the womb, before I I formed you in the womb. I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart to serve me. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Among the Bible verses that we got very familiar with were Proverbs 31, 8. Speak out for those who cannot speak. And the way that was immediately applied to our young minds and hearts is babies can't speak. 
If there's anybody vulnerable in this world, it's them. It's the child in the womb of the child when they just come out of the womb. So, so what we were allowed, my, my brother and my sister and I, we were, we were allowed to march in the march of the life, but we couldn't go to the clinic. Dad went to the clinic uh, frequently. And it probably wasn't the most winsome strategy, but, but Dad and others would sit in front of the doors. They would sit right there. They would, they, and what was the motivation? They were putting their bodies, this is the motivation, they put their bodies between innocent lives and the Nile River. Because life mattered. They were pleading for life at the door of the clinic. And I remember mom saying, dad got arrested today and I've never been more proud. <laughs> He was my favorite ex-con in the Mason household, was my dad. How do believers respond? Four things. We pray, so we beg the Lord to turn hearts. Last week's message, right? Intercession is a way in which the Christian does business with God. We pray for God to turn hearts. We pray for God to change laws. We pray for God to protect the innocent. We pray, we stand. So we use our voices to champion the cause of life. We volunteer in the cause of life. We donate to the cause of life. We celebrate adoption because it provides another option that is, that is a life option. We pray, we stand, we plead. Moms and dads would choose life. Moms and dads would consider other alternatives besides abortion. Please, any other, any alternative. Please, don't kill the child. We plead. Jeff Durbin is a, is a pastor of Apologia Church, and he, um, he loves to share Christ with people. He has a passion for evangelism. He's a winsome evangelist. He's not one of these angry, nasty evangelist types, right? He, he's a winsome, loving, compassionate evangelist. And, um, but he also loves the cause of life, and he, he pleads um, for life of the unborn, and he tells a story of, of how it started in his life. He said, members of our church would go to the clinic and, and we would pray for the Lord to turn hearts and we would pray for opportunities and we would have conversations with people. And again, not angry, militant, God hates you kind of conversation, compassionate conviction conversations. And he said, we saw the Lord turning hearts. The first day we went out there, he said, two babies were saved, two babies. And he said, but even though we did that over time and the two became 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 55 and the numbers were going up and he said, it still didn't feel quite real. And then one day he said, we were there again outside the clinic and we saw a husband drop his wife off inside and the husband walked outside and they said, can we talk to you about abortion, about what's going on in there? And they found out in the course of the conversation, this husband was largely in the dark about what abortion is and what abortion, the facts of abortion. He was unaware of that. And he said, we shared it. And this man was in tears. And he said through tears, I urged her to do this. And he ran inside. And the workers would not let him back beyond the doors. They said, she's already in pre-op. He said, I'll knock the door down. He said, I told her to do this. I have to talk to my wife. And they didn't want a bigger scene than was already there. So they let him through. And she was in pre-op. And seconds before, they killed their baby. Seconds before, the baby was spared. And they walked outside, his husband and his wife, and Jeff Durbin said, we were so affected, we were so thankful to God. And he said, but it still didn't quite click until two months later. He said a woman walked into Apology at Church with a boy. And they recognized her. And she said, this is my son. His name is Carmelo. And he said, she graciously gave us the ability to pass Carmelo from hand to to hand and she said the whole church was weeping and rejoicing and praising God because he's an image bearer and they pleaded for his life and God had a purpose for Carmelo. We pray, we stand, we plead and we love. We love. We love on all sides of this, right? We want to be a church that loves broken people back to life. Don't we? 
That's the kind of church we want to be. We want to be a church that walks with shame-ridden people and walks them toward wholeness in Jesus Christ. If a woman in your small group confesses, I've had an abortion, and you fall out of your chair, you don't understand one of the most basic truths of the Bible, and it's this. Satan lies for a living, and he's really good at it. He's really good at lying. And the gospel empowers us to love people who, like us, have made a royal mess of things. If the gospel can't enter into there, then why are we proclaiming as if it's good news for the whole world? We sing the song, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other founts, nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus can cleanse every sin. That's the good news that we carry, right? There's only one fountain. We don't have to produce righteousness that God requires, our own record of righteousness. Jesus produced righteousness when he lived a perfect life, died on the cross in the place of sinners, and then rose again, and he offers his record of righteousness to any who believe, not on the basis of works, but on the basis of faith. If that message is new to you or it's clicking for the first time, I would just call you and invite you to believe, to repent and believe to follow Jesus as Lord. And then what happens? God moves on the inside to create a people who begin to love like he loves. We start looking more and more like the one whose character we're meant to reflect. Friends, church, listen. We can't honor God and destroy his image bearers. That's impossible. So God help us stand for those who cannot stand for themselves.